Well, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. I see a couple of people uh, that are still joining, so I will wait, I think, for a minute to start my, my talk. But uh, basically, uh, meanwhile, I just want to say that uh, I'm quite happy to be in a conference that it's not strictly about data science or data something. So I, the, the reason why I came, it's uh, because I want you all to feel anxious and excited about the new opportunities that will come uh, for artificial intelligence in the world of machine learning operations. So this is what we are going to be uh, talking today. And uh, I hope that you find this talk uh, interesting. So first of all, my, let me check. It worked like a minute ago, so <laughs> let me just click here because probably as yeah, okay. So this is uh, a little bit about me. Uh, you can connect me in Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you want. But uh, my background it's a PhD in artificial intelligence, and also I've been working for three years for a company called Singular in the data and AI team. Uh, we do a lot of projects, uh, basically AI related, of course, and um, mostly data centric, okay? But that doesn't mean that we uh, only have uh, data profiles. We also need some others, and that's why the title of the talk uh, refers to backend and DevOps profiles, okay? So first of all, uh, I want you to, to understand one thing. And this is all about understanding the data scientist's work. How we usually work when we work uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. So basically, and you have heard a lot of it, I'm pretty sure about, uh, we gather a lot of data. We gather all kinds of data from different data sources. It can be tabular, it can be images, video, audio, documents. Pretty much all of this is what I work every day with, okay? So the next step after I gather all this data is, okay, I need to explore, uh, I need to clean my data, I need to pre-process, I need to uh, see how the variables, how the features are, um, are distributed alongside the data set. I also sometimes need to uh, label, for example, images, and I also need to aggregate some data maybe to build on some other features, okay? But once I have my data ready, uh, I, I go straight to this, okay? As a data scientist, I will just build my data set for training, my data set for testing, and I will choose a machine learning algorithm, okay? It can be machine learning, deep learning, whatever you want. But the thing is that we are uh, mostly uh, used to do this kind of work. So this will uh, be repeated iteratively, and uh, there's a reason for this. The reason for this is that we need the model to learn, to be able to learn something. And that's why we need to do some experiments. We need to um, establish some test set, something that says, okay, I'm doing the work and I'm getting the expectations that I want, okay? So once I reach the, the evaluation metrics and I get my model, uh, what happens is that I try again. Okay, I try to optimize as much as I want, as much as I, uh, as much as I can. And usually, uh, if you think from the perspective, from the academic perspective point of view, uh, this is very similar to the scientific method. And the reason is because artificial intelligence, like five, six years ago, was barely an academic field, okay? So usually what we used to do was, okay, let's observe, let's question something about the data set or about the task that I'm about to, to solve, and let's try to put some experiments on and see if it works, okay? So that's mainly uh, what we've been doing, um, but the thing is that there's more. So the question that was arising like five years ago, four years ago, was, okay, I have an AI model, now what? What if I want this whole room to test my AI model? Am I able to do so? Because uh, if I'm working in my code, in my local environment, probably I will not be able to. I will need some server, I will need something that allows you 
to get into my model, okay, and to interact with my model. And this is where uh, a new, completely new uh, stage of AI, as a level of maturity, started uh, to be, well, pretty wild uh, spread into the people. So back in uh, 2015, there was a, a very, very famous paper from Google that was called The Hidden Technical Depth in Machine Learning Systems. And uh, this, uh, this picture, this illustration that you see here, has been very, very famous since that until now. And the reason is that uh, this image uh, was only created to demonstrate that artificial intelligence couldn't be an academic field anymore, or at least not only that. Uh, because what, uh, what we were mainly doing was to work with this black box that you see in the center of it. You see the ML model black box? So in the whole pipeline, in order to make artificial intelligence properly working for the real world, we will need the rest of them as well. We will need something to configure the environment. We will need some data collection uh, pipeline or something. We will need some feature extraction process. We will need uh, some process management tools in order to, for example, see reproducibility of the experiments. But we will also need monitoring, OK? And I know that you know a lot about all this. So this is why this talk is exciting to, you know, uh, to, to be said here. So what we are talking today is about machine learning operations. And I'm pretty sure that you have heard about the concept. I'm pretty sure that you know what DevOps is, of course. So machine learning operations uh, born after all this hidden technical depth of machine learning because a group of people from Google says, hey, we need to build something in order to accelerate our machine learning models into the real world, right? So the purpose is to continue uh, working on design, so this can be easily done by data scientists. Also, model development can also be done jointly with the data engineers. Basically, what we focus here is to gather requirements, gather ML use cases, which task am I going to solve? Is it based on images? Is it based on video, text? It will change, OK? Then we move into data engineering. So basically, how we uh, create all those data pipelines. Are we going to host the model in the cloud? Is it on-premise? All these questions will be arise here in the model development phase. And then we move into operations. And the reason of operations, uh, if you know the, the concept of the DevOps concept, you know it's all about maintaining and deploying software, right? So machine learning operations is all about maintaining and monitoring a data and data and um, an AI model. So what it means is that we need to look for reproducibility. We need to look for uh, something that it's called uh, model drift, which means that if I allow you to these, uh, I don't know, 300 people that are here in the room to interact with my AI model, probably you will interact in different ways. OK? And I need to monitor what happens afterward. There is something that it's called a uh, human in the loop that happens right after the model is on production. So if I gather all your information after interacting with my model, probably there are some use cases that I was not uh, included, that wasn't included in the training phase. Probably some others were not included as data, and I need to retrain my model. So machine learning operations uh, makes a lot of sense when you want to test the model in real life, and you are able to, well, uh, doing all these stages in order to uh, create some AI trustworthy system, OK? So let's see a little bit more about that. Uh, a lot of illustrations, by the way, come from that website that is called mlops.org, and it contains, I mean, most of the information that will be gathered in this talk. So we have, lot, we have talked about the continuous integration. We have talked about continuous delivery. And there is another concept. Okay, So continuous integration, you all understand what it is. If not, there is also a, a definition there. But basically, what it says is, OK, let's not focus on continuous integration as if it was a DevOps process, as if it was software, just software. Let's took also care 
of validating data and data schemas and models, okay? Then we move into the continuous uh, delivery. And this is uh, no longer about a single software package, right? We need to create an ML pipeline. If you remember, I have shown you uh, a diagram at the beginning of the talk that was saying uh, you take your training set, you take your ML algorithm, and you train, you know, and I was saying that this is like a cycle, a loop, so this is what we try to also emulate in the continuous delivery. So let's do something that allows me not only to retrain, but also to do some uh, prediction service that can be, you know, um, feasible to be accessed by all of you, okay? And then let's move into continuous training. So what happens after all 300 of you are interacting with the model? Am I able to monitor? Am I able to retrain my model? I need something. I need a cycle, a pipeline that allows me to do so. So this is quite exciting because we came from an academic field that was just only focusing on ML models and was just focusing on optimizing the model. And now I can create a whole ecosystem all around. So uh, the purpose is, okay, number three, how can I accelerate the AI in production? And this is not simple. I have to say that uh, it requires time. It requires also to understand a little bit of how machine learning uh, works, also how data scientists works. Um, but basically, it could be summarized, at least in a, you know, uh, the first level of complexity, it could be summarized into this illustration here. And this illustration also takes this diagram that I already shown you at the beginning of the talk. If you take a look, you will see data extraction analysis as the first step, okay? And it can take, of course, offline data that I've been gathering uh, for some reason, okay? Um, then you take this phase of uh, manual <coughs> experiment steps, and that's uh, the diagram that I showed you before, okay? That's where you prepare your data, you train your system, and then you evaluate and validate your system. And then you have a model, okay? After you train the model, you have a model. What happens after that? This is where machine learning operations starts to work. So the first thing that we can do is to create something that we are calling model registry, and this is quite evident. So if, I am, if I'm saying that I will iterate, I will create a set of experiments around just one model, it's quite interesting if I have some registry to just say, hey, this model was using these param parameters, it has these uh, metrics, it was evaluated using this data set, so I can keep, keep, keep track of what I've been doing, right? And then uh, the last part would be, okay, let's serve this model, let's put it on some website, on somewhere where you all can interact. So this is the easiest. And there are already some uh, services that I find one quite interesting in order for, um, you know, show them to people that are working with data, actually data scientists, data engineering, is quite fascinating when they find that uh, already these services exist so that it makes it easier for them to just show what they are doing. Because if I finish my model and I say, okay, interact with it, uh, if I don't have, I don't know, front-end skills, I won't be able to create uh, any interface, or at least it won't be pretty, right? So the cool thing uh, is that uh, there are two services. Uh, there are Streamlit and also Gradio that are already working into this kind of uh, diagram. So after I build my model, what happens is that I want to serve it. So if I am able to create some Python backend and Python frontend, it will be quite interesting in order to show to the people how the model works, but also for me as a data scientist in order to know how the model performs, how the model performs with data that I have not gathered before, okay? And with people that was not part of my experiment. And this is just a screenshot to show you that uh, this is more or less the kind of frontend that uh, these kind of uh, libraries are building. So they are based on components and they are quite easy to use. You can create your own frontend like in one hour. It's really, really easy. So this is what I was talking about. There's uh, two options. So either you go to Gradio that was now acquired by Hugging Face. So Hugging Face has created something that it's called Hugging Face Spaces where everyone can put uh, their models uh, on that website if they want to host it on the cloud of uh, Hugging Face. 
or you can also uh, do it locally or even in the cloud if you use Streamlit. So this is quite useful in order to, as I was saying, speed up a little bit the, the machine learning in the real world. This will be the, like, the easiest part. OK, let's move on. So what happens after I have managed to somehow uh, serve my model? OK, if you remember, I was talking a little bit like a minute ago about model registry. How do I register my models? How do I create my experiments? And uh, there is also a, a, a huge framework that it's called uh, machine learning flow and uh, flow that takes care of, it, of this. And this is quite exciting because um, before that, uh, as academics or even people that was working for companies but also mostly focused on AI research, it is really difficult to keep track of all your experiments. You need to think that uh, just for a model, you might have used thousands and thousands of data, you might have uh, partitioned data in different ways, you have also, uh, I don't know, like 10 parameters, 12 parameters, depending on the data model, on the AI model that you have chosen. So it is really, really uh, exciting that you have just uh, some way to track uh, what you are doing but also to register what you're doing, not only for reproducibility reasons, which is what the data scientist is really interested to, uh, but also in order to mark each of the models in different stages, because data scientists didn't know uh, that this was already done in software development. And this is quite exciting that we can you know, take all this knowledge and now apply it to uh, machine learning. So basically, what we will be able to do with uh, MLflow is to set up a server that essentially gives us some dashboard where all my models will be connected and will be tracked, okay? All, the, all these issues, these parameters, metrics, artifacts will be tracked and also uh, the stagings can be uh, marked, okay? You can choose them. And then, of course, you can connect it to APIs and something that will come uh, later. So, um, this is what should be like a usual, the main dashboard of MLflow. And this interface makes it very easy for data scientists to understand what they are doing and to en encourage this uh, reproducibility reason that it's the main thing for what data scientists wants to you know, get into the, into the ML ops world. So what you will find is that if you, for example, open some notebook or open some uh, notebook on the cloud, if you can track them using some ID, it's very easy to set up. Uh, after you have set up the server, of course, uh, it will be tracked in the bottom side of the dashboard, and you can see everything about the model. The most important part for a data scientist will be the metrics and parameters, as you can see there, the performance of your model. Okay? So this can be, uh, again, uh, like a level two of uh, machine learning operations. Okay? Uh, you can, by the way, deploy uh, the ML flow either on premise or also on the cloud. It's quite easy. It's just like pip install, pip install ML flow and a couple of, uh, of settings afterwards. And the level three, and this is where the thing starts to be very, very exciting, is okay, let's take the whole thing. Okay, I have my model registry, I have my model serving. Uh, what's next? And we were talking about continuous training. There are a lot of pipelines that you, can, that you can build in order to construct some machine learning operations life cycle, okay? And there are six points here that are related with uh, each part of the diagram. As I was saying, this is all uh, uh, hosted under mlops.org, and I encourage you to visit that uh, website as well. So there is this part at the top level that uh, says, okay, this is the test environment, let's say, just for deployment, uh, de development purposes. So what I want to see here is how can I create a pipeline that allows me to generate a model and to push that uh, source code to the repository or the cloud or whatever, okay? So the source code comes after point one. Then we continue and we get into the continuous integration pipeline. We build, test the source code, and then we have some packages, right? And we are in the point three. Point three is pipeline for continuous delivery. Now I can start thinking how to serve my model. Um, after I get to the, to the number three, 
if you see, there are like two, uh, there's like a second part, a staging for production production, you see like the, the box. So this is where ML ops takes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. Basically, after doing the pipeline deployment, you will be able to automate everything else because you are able to train the model. Now with all the new source code, it will include, for example, new parameters for your model. It will, uh, it will also get the, the new data, okay? And it will also get this uh, automated pipeline that comes from data extraction to model validation, which was what we were already doing, okay? With MLflow, Streamlit, and everything else. We were doing it manually, okay? So this is quite exciting because not only that, uh, but we can also store all the uh, data that we were using, all the features that we were using, how we built those features, if we were aggregating them, all that can be stored under, under the feature store, which means that uh, I will not have uh, a lot of uncontrolled or wild data sets. I will have an organized manner to just take those, leave those, and select what I want in, in, a, more, in, in a more organized way, okay? Um, after I have my automated pipeline, I go to model serving, number five, okay? And then uh, I can go, of course, to the model serving and performance monitoring. So as you can imagine, this is uh, something very exciting, but it's a little bit hard to implement by ourselves. So that's why the people from Google, the ones that were working on this hidden technical depth of machine learning, uh, well, created uh, Kubeflow, okay? So Kubeflow, um, basically, I will later show you the, the, um, the components of Kubeflow, but essentially does this, okay? The other diagram and this one. So it is creating, because the other di diagram sometimes is a little bit complex to understand, but essentially it creates some kind of state machine that does this in the background, okay? So it goes from the source code to some uh, packages, automated pipeline, in order to train the model. Uh, there is a trained model already, new data that comes from new predictions, and the model serving, okay, and monitoring. So um, in order to deploy uh, Kubeflow, you can do it again on your own. There is a lot of instructions that you can find on the website. I don't have time <laughs> to explain the whole Kubeflow, but essentially what it has is uh, everything that a data scientist and data engineer needs in order to speed up their work and in order to help them doing uh, more robust AI. So essentially, let's say that uh, it's hosted under Kubernetes, Kubeflow, mm -hmm. um, and then it can be deployed uh, in any cloud or on-prem, okay? Which means that, I mean, we don't have vendor locking or at least not a lot, okay? Uh, then you will find uh, these Kubeflow applic applications and scaffolding. So these are mostly connectors to create jobs that work for a specific machine learning framework. So in machine learning, we mostly use either TensorFlow or PyTorch, but there are some others like MXNet that was designed by AWS, and some others that are more classical like XGBoost. So you can easily create a job to automate uh, with a YAML file all these experiments. And this is what mainly uh, Kubeflow is, uh, how to use your knowledge on DevOps and try to apply it to ML ops to enhance this uh, reproducibility statement for machine learning. And then you can see uh, that there are like a lot of connectors for different services like monitoring such as Prometheus. There is also even a, a beta now for uh, auto ML model for Kubeflow uh, so that we could easily train even models without uh, doing it like uh, the, the definition of parameters without doing it manually. Um, so I think that this will continue growing and this is uh, really good news for us, okay? Um, but essentially, what should I do if, uh, if I'm not sure if I want to spend some time into creating my own Kubeflow? Because it might happen and it usually happens, I work as a consultant. So you see clients that have uh, their own data team, you see some others that uh, does not have a data team, but uh, maybe they have some models that want to be uh, in production soon, okay? Because the people is running to be, uh, well, the first to deploy something for AI. So um, 
what has happened is that these uh, people from Google, uh, the ones who created Kubaflow, um, have created, of course, a Google Cloud Platform version of it, and they have now rebranded everything that was related with uh, AI platform into Vertex AI. So you can uh, find easily find this uh, architecture, the complete ar architecture, under the, the, Google, the Google Cloud Platform environment. So basically what, what it does, it has, uh, if you see some uh, yellow box that I will now explain, but essentially it's the same if you read it from left to right. So it tries to enhance all those steps that you have on the top of the picture. So how to enhance data read readiness and feature engineering. That's why we have the feature store. Then we have uh, the training and hyperparameter tuning. That is what a data scientist does to optimize the model. And then uh, it creates well different pipelines. If you can, if you want to serve the model, for instance, in a web, it's different. That if you want to to serve it into a, into some uh, device such as a camera. I don't know if you have heard about edge computing but it's, it's also gaining uh, well attraction because you can deploy your own AI model into a device that it's uh, not connected all the time to the cloud, so it can just live into the camera and do those uh, predictions by themselves. And then you can periodically, like every two weeks or something, update the model using internet, okay? Um, so this is quite interesting because not only um, gives you the whole uh, machine learning operations view, but also uh, it allows you to do something, as I was saying, the, the auto ML, the yellow, uh, the yellow box. Uh, I was saying that in Qflow, you can do it now under a beta testing mode, um, but uh, in Vertex AI, which is essentially, as I was saying, a platform that has been uh, rebranded and has uh, are now more robust models, um, they already had these services, these vision, vision intelligence, natural language processing. They have like some uh, very simple services in order to set up your own algorithms if you don't have uh, some data knowledge or data scientists to work with. If your use case is one of those, probably you can use some uh, AI service that just set up those models and ingest them uh, into the Vertex AI platform which contains all the MLOps cycle, okay? So um, this is also a good point for those of you that don't know how to train an algorithm, but maybe have some credits on the cloud and can give it a chance. You can do it all using this uh, AutoML platform. Um, and the other thing that uh, they have um, that they have included, and I find uh, quite interesting, especially if you work on the data field, is the Vizier optimization. This is a, a new module that they have uh, developed. Uh, this, was, this, was, this used to be like a Google library, uh, but I think it was like internal, and they released it a, while, uh, a little bit ago. So this here does hyperparameter tuning uh, also automatically. So one of the pain points of a data scientist is how to optimize the model, how to make it learn faster and also in a, most, uh, in a more robust way. So this year takes care of that, and uh, apparently it puts some intelligence there and gives you sooner uh, an optimization of your algorithm. And also, uh, I want to bring this topic here because it includes a module for explainable AI. And this is quite interesting as well, because uh, we were talking about machine learning operations, which it's all about reproducibility, maintainability of your AI models. But there is also a pain point here, which is uh, how do we explain what our models do? Uh, I don't know if you have heard of it, but deep learning is facing a lot of issues with this topic. So now, because we work into this machine learning operations life cycle, it's really easy for us to include new models, to include new pipelines. So if I have a pipeline for training, if I have another one for uh, model serving, for model registry, why not may I have one for explainable AI? So I can run on uh, some other algorithms that try to uh, shed some light on my uh, machine learning algorithms in order to explain a little bit more what they do, what decisions they make, okay? And uh, the good thing is that, well, it can be 
use either with notebooks or with your own Python code, whatever you want, okay? So mostly the same can, could be uh, implemented in Kubeflow, but of course the, these explainable AI pipelines and the visual optimization won't be there, so you can do it ourselves, uh, yourself. Um, it's not hard, but it takes time. I have to be, I have to be honest. So, um, main conclusions of this, and I will use uh, this to wrap up my talk. Um, well, I hope that you find it interesting. I think it's a really nice topic, uh, and I have seen that there are some other talks that will uh, specifically talk about these stages of uh, machine learning operations. So I hope you learn a lot about, uh, about this. I just want to say that uh, data scientists and data engineers cannot work alone anymore. Please help them. <laughs> this is your work to do. Um, I find it very hard when you get into a data team or an AI team and they are like, well, I'm doing my model, and the other is like, well, I'm doing my data pipelines, and it's like, well, we have to talk with each other. We need to understand each other. So I know that a lot of people knows about cloud, knows about backend, knows about DevOps. It's your time to uh, listen to your uh, data colleagues and try to get the most of it, because it's going to be a lot of work in this field. And believe me when I say, and I've been working in AI for almost six, seven years, and uh, we never go, got to this point that fast. I mean, and the thing that we can deploy all these uh, AI models into production means that we will face new challenges, and those challenges will include more of monitoring, more of model drift, model registry, and all these things that we have talked uh, around today. So the field will grow, and this is only uh, the beginning. This uh, figure, this profile of the machine learning operations, such as DevOps, will continue growing. And then, uh, of course, if you don't know how to start, as I was saying, I was putting three levels of complexity. Let's start with the easiest one. Let's say to our data team, okay, you know that there exist some libraries where you can easily put there some front end, and this is like the back end, and it was, this will talk uh, through an API. So let's explain some concepts that might, that might not be um, uh, evident for those people, because maybe they come from statistics, or maybe they come from engineer, but they were not very focused on software development. So let's try again to uh, explain those concepts, and then, Listen to them when they talk about model serving, model registry, tracking server, all the, all the needs that they have. You can provide those very easily because you have the knowledge. It's just a matter of applying it to data. And of course, let's not forget that the whole experience includes continuous delivery, continuous integration, and also continuous training, which is quite, quite, quite interesting in order you know, to establish a future of AI in a responsible and also in a transparent way. So I hope that uh, you like the talk. I don't know if we have some time for questions, but if not, there is a coffee break. So I would easily and happily answer to your questions there. Thanks a lot. <laughs>